Okay, welcome to 28th September 2020 Mycroft Dev Sinking. Okay, so we are now officially halfway through our sprint. Let's uh, do a check in and see if there's anything that has become roadblocks and check in with everyone and see uh, how we're progressing. Um, and then at the end, I'd like to do a quick review of the current milestone that we're heading towards and uh, see if there's anything we can do to uh, focus our efforts more tightly on containing it. So, uh, I'll start with uh, Gez today because Gez is in the top center position. Um, cool. Uh, so I did some com stuff and mocked up the, that partnership post that we um, are working on, which Maybe ready to go soon. Um, I saw an email from Johnny, but maybe not. Um, uh, I've also started the. I, I also started a, a, a blog post outline for our October Mark II update. Um, since we're already getting some things to talk about there. Um, uh, the twenty oh eight change that Chris did um, looks good. Um, and so I've done uh, the ticket around removing um, wait for message. So just so that we can test it by having something that is um, definitely going to fail if the 2008 image doesn't exist. Um, so I just need to get those merged and, and in, and that will be a pretty firm test on that. Um, and want to get back to exposing the logs in the point comp runs um, next before anything else, I think. So that's where I'm at. Okay, great. Uh, I assume no hiccups or emergencies have come up? Uh, no, just lots of, uh, you know, reviews and things like that, but nothing blocking. Okay, great. Uh, Chris Vera, how's it going? It's going awesome. Before I start, I want to say, go Chiefs, Ravens suck. Um, <laughs> uh, so things are going well. I have all of our third party UI packages upgraded to their latest right now, and I'm going through all the UI components and making sure I didn't break anything by doing that. Um, I also talked to uh, Derek this morning. We have a little more clarity around the uh, the first version of the Tagger UI. Um, he made a few small changes, and um, I think we may he may have another small round of changes after our discussion, but um, so once I'm done getting, I'm sure, the Angular uh, and, and related software updates work. I can start looking at that. Okay, great. Uh, Ken. We lead in by saying, sometimes when people come from Baltimore and their team is playing Kansas City where they live now, they could be conflicted. It's good to see that you definitely have an allegiance. <laughs> I'm, I've been living in Kansas City now longer than I ever lived in Baltimore. So. <laughs> <laughs> so I had an interesting weekend, but um, just to cover real quickly the tickets I'm working on, I closed a couple of tickets out to do with uh, or reassign one for yes, no, and for um, the initial switches since all that's been fixed and addressed. The... Uh, the enclosure uh, ticket I'm working on, the reason I was having such difficulty is in getting the um, LEDs working last week, I had to install a bunch of stuff as sudo, uh, and it wasn't clear at the time what needed to be sudoed and what didn't. It's become clearer now that just the LEDs require sudo. The switches don't. The volume doesn't. Uh, so that's, that's something that had to be addressed. I also had a system-wide parameters set in the virtual environment to allow system-wide installs to work, but 
That was causing some trouble with clashes between modules. I turned that off and still was able to get it working with sudo. Uh, a lot of the problem I was having was that a lot of the sockets like message bus and stuff were opened under sudo last week. And um, then when you try to close them or take them down, you have to be sudo. And uh, since the startup was set to sudo, but I didn't do stop, there were some problems I had to go back and clear up and, and clean things out and remove caches and stuff. But I'm, I'm back to normal where it's working. Um, a little concern with the hardware, though. So over the weekend, I think I pointed out uh, in the thread some of us might have seen that my particular SJ201 that I got, the second one, uh, is defective. Um, we knew that. But uh, it's not, you know, it's obviously not showing the, uh, the I2C device, which was the first trigger for that. But more importantly, my friend came over the weekend and noticed that one of the two speaker drivers were <laughs> on at full power constantly. And he was freaking out. He was like, that's going to burn something out. Turn it off, turn it off. So I basically unplugged the one. Uh, so the other one is OK. Uh, but I had to unplug that. Now, I don't know what that might have taken out or how it got like that. But I do know that since... I had the new, the new SJ201, or the old one, I'm sorry, plugged in. So the new one never worked. The old one always worked. But recently I took it from just being an external connection with the amplifier to actually plugging it in to the pins. And ever since I did that, it doesn't record. It thinks it is, but it doesn't actually record any sound. And I verified by taking it back off and connecting it to the re-speaker, which was originally and still here, and that works. So that's a little bit disturbing. That, that might have taken out the mic channels as well. I don't know exactly what happened, but that's where it's at. Uh, and I'm afraid to plug any more back into the pins <laughs> because we're getting short on SJ201 and I, I don't have any working and I've got software that expects to be able to do power on self tests and <laughs> with new drivers and I don't have working SJ201s. So uh, I know Kevin will be back near the end of the week. Uh, I can certainly uh, get through between now and then. Uh, but that's something I think we need to address and look at um, because that's a little bit of a concern. Um, other than that, yeah, like I said, I got the uh, pseudo stuff for the LEDs. It seems to work. Uh, I've got a couple of things to finish off on that. Uh, and I should have the enclosure stuff uh, integrated and ready to do a pull request um, before the next uh, meeting on Wednesday. Uh, I'll assume it works <laughs> uh, with working hardware. Um, and then I'll give that to Chris V and he can, he can do the code review on it. Um, and so, yeah, that, that's what I've been working on. The power on self test is going to be interesting too, because we're going to have to really be creative, right? I'm going to have to do things like turn on the speaker, turn on the mic, play something while something's recording and make sure that we got something recorded. Cause other than that, what am I going to do? There's not going to be somebody sitting here watching the LEDs blink. There's not going to be somebody, you know what I mean? So power on self test for audio and, and visuals is tricky. Uh, that being said, it's not impossible and people are doing it. So I'm just going to have to buckle down, but uh, that's, that's in the near future. So that's where I'm at. I'm going to try to button up the enclosure code, try to fix the, um, or add the code that uh, reports the Mark II uh, during uh, device bring up um, or pairing, initial device pairing, uh, and then handle the case where maybe I can get some additional information that I can uh, stick in there so that we can know whether it's a Mark I, a Mark II, Mark II with re-speaker, Mark II with SJ201, Mark II-3, uh, maybe somebody's Linux, you know, all the different stuff so that we can have a better handle on where we're running so that when we look at issues in the reported, maybe we could even, you know, align them and say, well, that's on an unsupported environment block. So that's, that's kind of where I'm at. <coughs> okay. Yeah. Uh, thanks for that update. I'll address some of those hardware issues uh, when it's my turn. Uh, but for now, let's go to Derek. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, late today I, um, <clears throat> I yeah, like uh, Chris said, I met with with him on the GUI for the tagger. Uh, there's a couple things outstanding, so don't get a completely mark that is done. Uh, but that should uh, be wrapped up pretty easily this week, and I'm not blocking him, which is good. 
Um, <clears throat> so other than that, uh, the couple quick changes, quick updates for uh, Michael's uh, pitch deck, and then just been continuing my work on the um, the first three D printed FDM version of the SJ two forty as we're calling it, um, and kind of balancing some of that with uh, going back and forth on sourcing stuff. The latest thing that I've spending a little bit more attention on is a camera module, uh, which isn't uh, necessarily the highest priority in terms of the first spin here, but you know we've got a lot of factors that uh, select that, so we've got to figure out how how that's going to work. And the camera version that we we're looking at originally was the uh, the Pi camera version one, so I've been kind of tracking down the best way to, to get one and or price wise and then uh, how it's all going to come together and make it work. So that's about, that's about all I've been up to. Okay, okay. Um, so uh, Josh, do you want to say anything um, about uh, stuff you've been looking into? Sure. So a couple quick things. Uh, I loaded a Pi 4 uh, to use as a video conferencing system. It's still a little laggy and there are tweaks that need to be done. But uh, the first time I tried it, everything kind of died and it did not work well. So I spent a little bit of time digging into the Pi 4 and how to make it the performance improve and discovered that the thing's pretty severely underclocked out of the gate. Um, by default, they run it at 700 megahertz, and the thing will run pretty reliably and pretty easily at 1700 megahertz um, without overheating. Uh, I did hook a heatsink to it. Uh, the other thing that I discovered is that, you know, for using that GPU, you can vary the amount of RAM that's allocated, and the default RAM allocation is dynamic and does not do it justice. And so, as a result, the uh, you know, out of the gate, if you want to use it for video conferencing, and I can only assume for, you know, other high, high intensity computation, uh, it's not really uh, a solid, solid out of the gate. But once you tweak the memory and you tweak the clock speed, uh, you really can get pretty decent performance out of it. Um, other than I can't get Bluetooth to do what I wanted to do out of the box. Um, I'm pretty happy with the, with the, the Pi as a video conferencing system. Um, the other thing I've been playing with is a technology from Google called Coral. Um, so Google has developed a series of chips that run uh, their TensorFlow Lite and then uh, what are called AutoML models. And what they're targeting is, in, is, well, they're targeting a number of things, but one of the things they're targeting is industrial automation. And so, um, you know, basically building inspection algorithms that use machine learning at the edge in order to classify images and do inspections of what PCBs or whatever, whatever you want to, whatever you want to do. So I got one of those from Mouser in a USB form factor, but they do make it in a chip form factor for sub twenty dollars, and it is demonstrably better for running TensorFlow Lite models, like by a factor of thirty, um, than the existing, uh, uh, the existing software. And so as we step into the Mark III, I think it's something we should look at as a feature on the, the next device that we integrate one of these uh, TPUs onto our daughter board so that we can do TensorFlow models uh, in the field. In the meantime, these USB sticks are only 60 bucks. And so as we're doing development on the Mark II, um, you know, as it, as it becomes our default platform and we start looking at new uh, applications, it's really easy to add that feature to an existing Mark II uh, by plugging it into a USB 3 port. Uh, and then all of a sudden you get this, you know, massive uh, improvement in, in your machine learning models. Um, the one caveat is those models do need to be compiled down to run and to take advantage of the processor. So you, you do need to, when you compile them, flag it appropriately. Uh, but I've been really happy with it. And I've been doing image recognition on high resolution images using an off the shelf model from Google and getting, you know, five millisecond classification times for eight meg JPEG, eight megabit JPEGs. So, I mean, there's, there's a lot of, 
there's a lot of really cool things that that facilitates. Um, other than that, I'm mostly, I'm jealous that Ken got two Mark twos and I got none. Uh, and then I've been oh, on. You was working well. <laughs> and then I've been on with the patent attorneys and, and uh, I mean, it's really clear that we're going to win the litigation. It's really clear that the unified patent IPR is going to be successful. And it's really clear that we have a stellar shot at um, recovering our money from their shell company, if their shell company even exists at the end of this. So, I mean, there is an ass kicking in the works for the patents, but it is, it is expensive. Um, that said, we are committed to spending as much money as it takes to kick in these people to the curb. And for those of you who saw American History X, um, just envision the scene that, um, that sent our good friend Ed Norton to prison. And uh, that's exactly what I figuratively intend to do with our friends at um, Voice Tech. So. Well, Josh, let, let me just say that uh, I'm proud to be associated with a group that decided to not cave and just send over 30K and have them leave us alone, but actually give like a quarter of a mil retainer to, the, to our attorneys to fight it, because that's really what it's going to take uh, long term to get these guys to stop their nonsense. That being said, on the TensorFlow, the TFU, what is the cost of those, the uh, the USB 3 TFU? Uh, they're 60 bucks. You can buy them from Mouser and plug them in. And then and in the chip form, in the surface mount form, like one up, they're like 21 bucks. And then it goes down from there. So, you know, as to whether or not our friends at Google are subsidizing that, I don't know. I suspect they probably are so that they can become the standard. Um, but it's, it's a feature that we should look at. And, you know, we don't have to marry Google to make that happen. We could both Intel and NVIDIA are making similar products. And so, um, you know, it's just well, that Mike, Michael, Michael can lay one out for us eventually. Uh, the thing is, the uh, <laughs> when, when he has some free time on a weekend. <laughs> now, the thing is, um, twofold. The, the reason I've been apprehensive about TensorFlow Lite is I have a friend who did some work with TensorFlow Lite. Uh, and he said that TensorFlow Lite has some bugs that he's kind of waiting for them to be uh, corrected before he moves forward with that in, in a big way. The other thing is I noticed that, and this is common with ARM processors, all four of the cores, when you're idling, um, will basically reduce down to the minimum frequency. And then I noticed that when Precise gets loaded and kicks off, it'll actually run them up to their max, which is 1.5. And that'll be across all four. Uh, somebody had mentioned that they thought we were only running and consuming one core, but my experience has been, and you can see it with top as they, as they ratchet up, that the, uh, we're, we're pre Precise is using about 50%, 45 to be technically accurate, of all four cores simultaneously. I did not see it just using one. Um, so that was my experience. And it ratchets up as uh, Precise runs. Uh, so, you know, it'll try to go down. That's really something that all these arms do that we don't need because we're not worried about conserving battery. So, yeah, uh, forcing them all to max frequency, and uh, I don't even know if it would get that hot. But, uh, yeah, I don't see any issue with that, and that would certainly be better for us. But, yeah, uh, I'm a little apprehensive about TensorFlow Lite right now. So running them at a fixed frequency, there's a couple of things. First of all, the power used on a chip like this, a inordinate percent of it is just from the clock line itself. So, you know, basically every, you know, power is consumed on an integrated circuit when it, something switches from a one to a zero. So the thing that's switching the fastest is the clock line. Um, but, uh, and there's a ton, ton of buffering on that, you know, all throughout the chip to make sure that it stays synchronized. But, um, you you won't really overheat the chip or really get it towards its max temperature unless the data pipelines are actually being used because the clock line will be running and sure that's using more power but if the data lines aren't actually switching then you know you really won't be using a, a lot of power so I think you're right I think we can probably uh, try to set the frequency to a, a fixed higher frequency and get something that's a lot more dependable in terms of uh, or predictable in terms of its performance I think uh, I think that's a good idea. Uh, the other question I have, though, about that is, 
um, can we restrict a process to running on a particular core? Uh, that's something that we might want to look at. It's certainly not a priority, but this, that'll help with the predictability again of the process. That's a good question. I don't know the answer to that. I just thought that somebody had made a, a comment last week that we were only supposed to be running precise on one core. That was something and I heard when talking with the guys earlier on uh, here. But clearly that wouldn't work if it's consuming 50% of four <laughs> cores. You're not <laughs> Basic math says you're not going to be able to run it on a single core without degradation. Is it at, at what speed, though? That's what the mall, but when they get... In other words, you can see on top it starts ramping up and the, you know it, it come it spikes and it starts coming down and when you finally get a chance, I have a little monitor program I can share that'll show you the usage uh, percentage usage of each core. Uh, it ramp it runs them all up to 1.5, right, like right away. They're all at 1.5 at 50 percent. Okay. Yeah, so two cores is going to be the minimum. It looks like, but I don't know for sure. Maybe there's some. Maybe there's some. I don't know. Some some lax uh, idle cycling in there. I just don't know enough. I, really I, have enough. Well, I, I strongly, I strongly, yeah, I strongly s suspect that that uh, training precise using TensorFlow Lite or a machine learning framework that's a little more um, modern uh, will be helpful. I mean, precise was originally built three years ago. The the that field is moving. With a rocket engine underneath it, you know, there I I suspect that <laughs> it, it just comes down to expertise. Let's get the data in order, and then if necessary, I I suspect there are people in our community that can probably do it in an afternoon. Uh, we we will ask and, and see if we can get some folks to help us. But unless we can provide them with training data that's pristine and you know that's where the that's where the the piece that we need to provide. Yeah, that's what we're working on actively, right? So that's that's good. Uh, did I, I I posted I I reposted the article by the way, uh, on my LinkedIn. Did I read that article right? That we're just a couple of percentage points away from uh, the same performance that our competitors were getting, and and they're a little bit larger than us. Yeah, that's really they were, encouraging. They were tying our stuff to well, and our stuff's you know available, and you can use it without like having to sign an LOI and like go off and talk to the wizards, right? Where's this article? That's not even our latest and greatest. So, so yeah, that's encouraging. Um, well, no, nor are we doing any of the transfer learning stuff that we should be doing at the top of that model in order to in order to narrow it down to this specific user. So we. And if I read the article right, that was with a custom wake word we did for that particular experiment, right? I didn't do the wake word. Somebody they probably did they did it for our <laughs> model. Yeah. So who knows how they did it? Because we haven't really. Yeah, that's that's yeah. There's that's a formula for failure too. Okay. So yeah, it's it's encouraging to know we're if we're behind, we're not that far behind. Daddy, um, let me play. <laughs> Excuse me a moment, I'll be right back. Uh... Guys, uh, I'm on a phone call. You guys um, where was that article? Okay. Was it... Uh, it, wasn't it Sherrod and Team, Josh? Where, where did I see it? Dev Team or Team? Let me see. I got it from a number of different people, but the one of them, I, I don't know. Um, uh, Daniel Pomp, I think, turned over a copy. No, but I think he just wants to see where it is so he can see it. Uh, I got it from Mattermost somewhere. Yeah, hold on. I'm getting it for you. Here's a PDF version of it in the chat. Cool. Uh, yeah, we. I got it. A number of people flagged it, flagged it for me. It, it, our investors are awesome. They, uh, they, uh, they are a giant information conduit about all kinds of things. Well, I thought it was very encouraging, uh, considering it's three years old and, you know, God knows how that model was created. And, you know, you're talking about those guys being able to throw a ton more resource at the problem than we can. So all good. Yeah, I was able to train models for precise in a very short period. You know, I think I spent a couple of days on it before I was able to train custom models and stuff. But the 
the challenge came down to um, I was in January, um, just getting the data pipeline squared away, and uh, and then I didn't do any like edge work. I just implemented it as it was originally documented, and plus whatever fixes needed to go in. And then I checked my own code in and approved it, which I got. I, I was people people didn't like that. <laughs> I, I think we're really at the point where the model's pretty good. I don't know. I can't speak to the internal algorithm, but it, from an outside perspective, looking in and talking to Matt, uh, it seems like the de facto way people attack the problem. I, I really suspect it's a matter of data at this point. Yeah. So sorry about that interruption there. Um, yeah, I think this really highlights the fact that what we're trying to do right now is get an instance of it up and the whole system up and running, right? From the hardware to Selene to the, uh, the the submission and review and tagging and training process, get that get all of that up and running in a solid system, and then I think you know uh, we'll see rapid rapid improvements in the software once we can get to that point. So uh, so that's really where our focus is. Um, so before jumping into the milestones, I'll just give you a quick update uh, on things from my end. Um, we're, I was hoping to get the SD201 next spin out uh, over the weekend, uh, but there was a, a little technical detail I didn't know about in that the, uh, some of the mounting holes were moved, which seems like an innocuous change, uh, but it turns out that was the biggest change on the whole board that caused uh, I don't know, Kevin said something like almost every net in the, uh, on the board had to be re relayed out because those mounting holes changed, uh, which theoretically isn't a problem. Uh, you know, from a logical perspective, it's not a problem, but from a, uh, from an electrical, you know, point of view, you've got to go through and review all of the ground planes and make sure none of the clocks are routed next to signals and stuff like that. So, um, so it's kind of a bigger deal now. So we're gonna have to go through a little bit of a design review process tonight uh, and, uh, and make sure that that's not gonna cause any problems. And so also as a consequence of that, we're going to, um, we're gonna do a, a more limited run than I was hoping for. So, um, so we'll do enough that uh, if they do work and there's a very good expectation you know, on our part that they will work, uh, everybody in our company will at least have two devices to work with. Um, and uh, the uh, and I want to use a process. Uh, I don't want to use the same process we used last time, where we kind of do it half half there and half here. We're going to use a PC uh, VA factory that can um, do all of it. do all the boards, source all the parts, and that sort of thing, so that we know that if these work, we can just go back to them and say, "Send us 500," you know, and we'll fulfill our Kickstarter on the devs uh, uh, for the you know the the dev board versions of that at least. And uh, start that pipeline again. So, um, so that's uh, so that's where we are with the with the Mark twos. Um, and uh, you know, on the on the component side of things, like the changes are really really minimal. We're fixing values on two capacitors. We're swapping out the sound card for an, uh, a different, um, a much simpler part uh, that um, uh, we've that we've already tested uh, by uh, Kevin. Kind of you know wiring it up externally, um, so all the changes that we're making are you know on that side are pretty simple. So uh, I have a pretty high confidence that this is going to work. Um, One last thing on that hardware, my my friend and I don't I'm not an aficionado. He looked at the board and he said, "Dude, who laid out this board?" And I said, "Well, that guy Kevin you talked to." He said, "That's a damn good job." So for what it's worth, no, he thought he was pretty impressed. Cool, that's great to get that feedback. I'll, I'll pass that along to Kevin. Um, so I was also looking at the TPU stuff uh, that Josh brought up. Uh, XMOS, the company that's making the uh, audio front end chip that we're using, also has a TensorFlow processor accelerator that they're touting. Um, but like the Coral system, they're not really generally available yet. So I've applied in both cases to their, uh, to their program to get into you know, see if we can get uh, engineering uh, samples and that sort of thing. So that's, um, you know, I don't want that to become too much of a distraction, but it's definitely something we need to be looking at for the Mark III. And the sooner we can get into that, the, the better. Um, yeah, 
any other questions people have on any of that? All right. Um, the so as far as the milestone goes, um, I'm looking at uh, so we've got kind of like three tracks that we're working on, right? We've got the hardware track, um, we've got the uh, the software track, uh, and we've got the um, the sort of update track, right? The there's the, there's the the core software as you know as a unit that does something useful, right? It does the voice uh, assistant stuff. But then there's the sort of overarching, how do we deploy this? How do we do updates and that sort of thing? So that's sort of the other the other major track. And um, as part of the, the core experience, we've also identified the Wi-Fi setup as a, as a key issue that we need to get right, because that pertains to the user's out-of-the-box experience. You know, just plugging it in and setting it up, that's gotta be, that's gotta be good. Um, so as a sort of minimal viable product, we need to get all of those things into a solid state because if, if we can at least do updates, then we can um, then we can you know we can rapidly improve the software, right? Um, and uh, so I, I want to make sure that uh, as we go into our uh, next sprint, that we're focused on those issues, right? Uh, Obviously, we've been focusing a lot on the hardware, um, and uh, Josh has been doing some investigations into uh, some of the various uh, third-party solutions that can help us with the uh, the firmware update process. Um, and uh, and some of those include Wi-Fi setup, and some of them don't. So, um, but regardless, I want to make sure in our next sprint, those two items are part of our regular um, <clears throat> uh, planning process. <coughs> Now the Wi-Fi setup, the Wi-Fi setup is um, an issue for a consumer product or an appliance, but for a developer kit, is there any reason why they can't plug in a keyboard and, for example, and edit their WPA supplicant file themselves? I mean, what are we shooting for here for the developer kit? Um, I, I think that for the developers. Uh, you know, we need to make it clear what they're getting into, right? So if there are developers who are just waiting for, like, look, you just give me a piece of hardware, I don't care, you know, about the fanciness, right? Then sure, here, download this USB image, uh, you know, uh, flash it to your USB drive and uh, plug it in. You know, that's that could be our update process, right? Um, but, uh, you know, we still got some stuff to do until we get there, right? For example, uh, the firmware isn't all on the USB. Some of it's uh, in, you know, the EEPROMs on the XMOS chip and stuff like that. So we need to make sure that we can update that stuff reliably, and um, you know, we don't want to be breaking people's devices. Um, you know, so uh, even if we can just ship them a new USB update. So you know, there's a couple of, of little minor things. I don't think that's a huge concern. Um, but yeah, if we can, you know, tell the developers what they're getting themselves into with at any particular phase. I've got no problem with releasing those dev kits uh, without um, necessarily 100% of those features. Right? Um, but certainly, before we go into any kind of beta program uh, with end users, you know, we need to have that that stuff sorted out. And because I think that's going to be the long haul, I want to start focusing on it now. Like, we're, we're the the light is you know we can see the light at the end of the tunnel for the hardware, right? These other processes we haven't really you know, begun in earnest. So I want to get those uh, you know, onto our development uh, path here. Um, Michael, I'm assuming I'm the only person that's um, had the issue where when he plugged his SJ201 in, his recording stopped working, correct? Because I would be apprehensive about ordering some runs until we had one maybe monkey wired to make sure that that's not the case. Uh, like I said, it didn't happen until I actually plugged it into the edge connector. The only, um, going solely by what you just told me, that sounds like a software problem, uh, but... Um, yeah, but it's not, because I can... Yeah, but I can just <laughs> unplug our board <clears throat> and plug the uh, same things into the, the speaker array, and it works fine. That's the first thing I thought was software. Right. 
Sorry, well, the re-speaker array and our board are a little bit different, right? Like, we're running, our USB is behind another USB hub, and there's, you know, that kind of stuff. Okay. So, okay. who knows? Uh, but Kevin's able to do recording just fine, but you're saying that, it, and you're saying the SB201 records fine as long as it's not plugged into the pot. I'm saying, I'm saying the SJ201 used to work fine with recording until I plugged it directly into the edge connector on the Pi, and now it won't record anymore. Oh, you like it's a permanent change. It seems to be. So uh, like the edge connector, does it work now? No. Ah, uh, okay. So you're thinking you might have fried the mics or something. I mean, if Kevin's testing it plugged into the edge connector on the Pi, then then I would be comfortable with that. But if he's testing it like plugging it into his Mac, then, you know, it's not it's not apples to apples would be my only concern. Yeah, sure. Um, go, can you file a bug report on that? Um, and uh, I will. Yeah, I'll I talk will. to him about that tonight. So one thing to keep in mind uh, is that all of these devices were hand assembled at some point. Right, Kevin soldered half of these things on by hand, including the highest density uh, or the yeah highest pitch uh, chip, which is the X. The, Q, the QSD. Yeah, it's a you know it's, it's apparently it's a bugger to, uh, to solder. Um, so all of these you know were going to be assembled at the professional side house next time, and uh, and we the other thing to keep in mind is we don't really have a test jig for these, right? We're not building a test jig until we know that we can at least get them working. And so uh, that'll be one of the next things we work on. So if we're going to make 250 of these or 500 or you know, 10,000, we need to have the test jig so that we can, we can test them when they come off the assembly line. So Yeah. Uh, I think that's what Kevin thought it might have been, was like cold solder or something. I, I told my friend, and he wanted to throw it in the oven at 425, but, and he said that would fix it. But then I said, well, but what about the plastic connectors? And... He said, ah, they'll be fine. So I had to grab it from his hand and not allow him to cook it. Uh, okay. That probably would be okay. I mean, if it's not working. So, always... so the, uh, the one thing I do want to point out is that uh, I will never be able to get the audio on this conferencing system working properly. Um, if you plug in this, the, uh, the it should work. Yeah, eventually I will, but I, I, it now lets you bond your phone call to the, to the thing, and I have a mute button on my headphone, so we, we will use this for the time being. I do need to make a little arm that swings down that brings it down to the, to the level that I'm at, but that's a, that is a project that I, that for another day. Um, I would like to point out that even if the SJ201 was perfect today, and even if we could do a couple of the big rocks that we need to do, like Wi-Fi setup and uh, updates, we still can't provide after five years a user experience for the top eight skills that um, that we can stand by in a demo for a company like Walmart or Target. Like the the software side of things, you know, from the everything from the wake we're spotting, you know, is continuing to have um, some accuracy issues. To um, you know, as far as I know, we haven't resolved the music problem that our friends at Spotify caused us um, this past couple of months. Uh, we're not ready to go, and and I don't think that 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 that's not going to wait until, you know, unless we solve those problems, it doesn't matter if we spend a hundred and something thousand dollars on on shipping dev kits. Yeah. No, I share your concerns, Josh, but I guess I've been comfortable in believing that once we get the enclosure level stuff and the uh, hardware and all the system level things going, then we would have the time to revisit the skills. And I've always looked at the skills being applications that run on top of our framework as somewhat trivial to correct once the framework is perfect. And so I've always kind of felt comfortable that we were not addressing the top eight skills right away because they're a trivial issue once all these other things are out of the way, I would think. Well, I wouldn't necessarily say they're trivial, but definitely by getting uh, you know, a limited number of units out into more people's hands and setting up the proper um, uh, feedback and, and, and error collection systems, uh, we'll be able to do you know, a lot of this UX work, right? A lot, of, a lot of UX work is, some of it's kind of you know, obviously broken and we should fix it. 
right? But a lot of it is also, it's just using it. And which is why, you know, we all want to have two of these things, you know, in our, uh, uh, in our environment, right? Like one for, one for death and one for work, one for home, you know, there's basically two different rooms in your house at this point, right? Um, but, uh, you know, we want to have these things around so that we can work on them and use them and, you know, eat our own dog food, right? And then, um, you know, and when we release, do a limited release to our, uh, you know, the developers who are most interested in, in working on these things, we'll get even more feedback on that sort of thing. And, and hopefully even assistance in improving those issues. Um, and um, yeah, so I'm, I'm really looking forward to doing that base because that's, that's actually really fun. I like doing that kind of design work and getting the feedback and, um, and doing that, that uh, usability testing. So, um, but yeah, we need, to, we need to have a platform on which to, to do that stuff first. Okay. Well, if there's a, if there's a, you know, the, we still need to make a decision between some of the update stuff and some, a few other things so we can, we can start chasing through that. Sure. Yeah. Um, I'm not talking about anything, uh, changing anything about what we're doing right now. Right. Um, just thinking for our next uh, sprint planning, which will, will kick off on next Monday, uh, we should uh, be keeping that in, in mind. Um, those are, those are some, you know, priorities that we don't want to, uh, become blockers for us actually uh, shipping product. <clears throat> um, I don't like sounding like a broken record, but some of those I feel are dependent on which GUI platform we go with. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> a man out from my own heart. <laughs> I, you know, I'll tell you what, the Kivi image is working good. The only concern, obviously, is the uh, community and the existing skills out there. Uh, maybe we could even figure out a way to uh, somehow build the conversion in. Uh, but I just don't feel like um, we have to make a decision on that just yet. I mean, I thought it was great to get it out there and get feedback and discussions. But, you know, I kind of agree with Josh. If we can get this going, then the next thing is we really probably should attack those skills and make sure they're usable. And then we can come back maybe and, and look at that. Do, do you believe that the performance of some of the skills and some of the problems that we're having are due to the selection of GUI? Uh, no, well, I think this... Go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. All right. Uh, well, so I, I do think that there might be some latency issues between or some discrepancies between the two, um, in that there are some extra flourishes in the cute version, um, that may be causing it to be a little slower, um, but those could possibly be turned off, um, just like extra animations and such. Um, <clears throat> But the problem that, you know, it's been on my plate to, to do what was kind of supposed to be a simple uh, fire both versions up as they are and take a video and bring that video in and, you know, create it a uh, comparison for you guys all to look at it, uh, <clears throat> see the state of where they're both at. But I've been kind of blocked by numerous hardware issues. I really only have one of the, um, speaker based devices and lately it's given me trouble and I'm not sure I've actually I've finally come around to thinking it is hardware after being very uh, <laughs> very stuck that it wasn't it was like okay I got this to work at one point so it can't be hardware but you know these, this thing's unreliable so I think that's a biggest blocker yeah you know not to sit back to the SJ201s yes when we all have two of them and we all should be able to then say, okay, this hardware is working, it's good, we've got past that hurdle. Let's fire up uh, the Kiwi and Cute and everybody take a look, you know, and because I could have guessed that really only Gez on the call right now has got a current um, kind of perspective on the, the comparison of the two. Yeah, and, and this is really something that the, the community can help us out with because uh, very early on, and this may very well be outdated information, I understood that the 
Qt uh, API relied on uh, you know hardware acceleration and needed m a lot more processing power to execute. Uh, regardless of like the flourishes and animations and the sort of things that you can actually do with it, right? So there's, you know, there's, I guess, the performance can be uh, associated with two different things, right? There's a thing that drives me crazy in that a lot of pe people designing UIs like to add animation as a way to making it look nicer. But it actually ends up, in my opinion, impeding the functionality of the device. And uh, so that's one issue. We can, we, if we can separate that off and then focus on just the responsiveness of it as a whole, right? Um, and how much of the system resources is going to take up, you know, in terms of memory, CPU cycles, um, and that sort of thing. Uh, that, uh, you know, getting a benchmark of how much, uh, how, how many resources it the Qt system requires versus the Kibi system, uh, I think is ultimately where we need to go. It'll be nice to have like a visual comparison like you're talking about, Derek, but I want to go under the hood too and look at, you know, actual MIPS, you know, to do a, a blip or whatever, right? Or whatever, right. You know, uh, all of the stuff should be pretty straightforward at a certain level, but I honestly, I have no idea how the Qt system works. Uh, and you know what kind of overhead it might be. Overhead it might be. So uh, if there's anybody out in the community who you know can enlighten us about that, or at least give us a head start. That would be awesome. Well, isn't there also? And this is something I didn't realize until I actually burned my new Pi Four. The uh, the instructions Derek gave me, you know, required me to put an SD card uh, in and put Raspberry in on it. So I could change the EEPROM to boot off of the USB drive. Okay. When I did that, what was really cool was I could use the touch screen like a touch screen. Because I don't have a mouse, I just have a keyboard. But between the keyboard and my finger, I had a complete UI. Now I'm looking and saying, how's that going to work using either Qt or Kivi? Do they have drivers for the touch screen? Because if not, we're engendering a hell of a cost burden for no functionality, and that doesn't seem like a wise decision. Well, I can answer that. Both of them work with uh, touch. Um, if on on Qt, so like I was trying to exit, well, Qt just has it, it's just, it's part of the GUI already. So like you can enter in your Wi-Fi's password and everything. All no, no. It's so, got you, a, so you have touch screen on Qt by default. Right, and it's got a nice menu you can pull down and do all kinds of settings and stuff. Um, Kiwi, we're not doing anything with it, but it actually works because I was screwing around with trying to exit to terminal on the device itself instead of being shelled in. And if you hit F1 in the Kiwi version, it's going to bring up the Kiwi menu. Um, and you, it, the touch is active. You can actually touch that menu and, and it's responsive. So if you just hit, if you're in Kiwi and you hit F1, you're going to get a menu and you can test it and see if it works. So both work without any extra setup or driver. So it's just a puzzle and nice thing about using that DSI display because it's just supported. It's okay. Um, so I guess my thing is, you know, we talk about, we've talked about this stuff and, and Derek's been trying to do that side by side, um, uh, at least from a, an end user UX perspective. Um, but. I just wonder if we need to, to get some of those tasks on the on the board of you know actually doing the the baseline test, um, you know whether that's me if I'm the only one that actually has two running devices or um, which are uh, they're OTS devices but you know they're working um, or someone else if, but if, you know yeah if you want to propose to put that into the next sprint. Uh, and you, you know the community is really uh, clamoring for an answer there. Then um, sure, we can we can try to prioritize that. It, it is something we need to figure out anyway. Um, well, I, I think I mean the community are, are, are asking me about it, um, obviously. But but also you know when we talk about things like the the Wi-Fi setup, you know, then that is inherently tied to which platform we're going with um, because they. They both use different systems, you know. I don't. I don't agree. 
I don't agree with that. The Wi-Fi setup stuff, you can abstract, like you can just assume that there's a command somewhere in the interface that lets you put that chip into into access point mode because every modern Wi-Fi chipset has that capacity. So like the Wi-Fi setup stuff is entirely UI. And uh, and I think we've got it or we got, we did it. It was pretty solid for the the one that we were working on last year. Like we'd gotten through it, you know, I don't know, a hundred times. We just need to get that codified and get it into the current software. Are you talking about the process where it goes into like mini server mode and then you can connect to it from your phone? Yep. Yeah, that's trivial. Yeah, that's, that's, all, yeah, that's, that's all the pro Well, you say it's trivial, but I've been waiting for a working version since 2018 or 2017. So like if we can, if we can just get through the, Hey, we can set this thing up and uh, get it on the network, connect it to the person's account, like play some music, right? Ask it how tall the Eiffel Tower is and have that entire experience end to end, not fall flat on its face. We could probably get some, some retailers to, to give us some pre-orders. But as it stands now, we can't eat, you know, we can't get to that point. And that's all software. That's almost, you know, we could use a laptop to do that. We could use a, I mean, there's a variety of different form factors we could use to at least go do the demos and stuff. Um, but yeah, and I, anyway. I get that we need that for any for any voice only device. But if if we have a, a device with a touch screen, do do we actually want to make users go off and grab their phone to to set the device up, or do we want to provide it? I, I agree with you 100. percent I agree with you 100. percent If we've got a touch screen, why are we making our life difficult on ourselves? I don't, okay, so uh, this is getting a little off topic, but uh, I don't understand why the choice of Qt versus Kibi has anything to do with Wi Fi setup. It doesn't. I mean, the I choice suspect, of Qt versus Kibi, in, in my view, in my view, who's arguing for Kibi other than Chris Vayer? And I love you, Chris, you're awesome. Let me just start with that. Well, it's not just Chris. Uh, I mean, I really okay. want to know the resource uses. Like, Okay, so from a resource perspective, right, it would be, be right a back. challenge. And I think that's the reason we selected it. Was, was the, the reason we selected Kivi for the, all the demos we did two years ago was number one, Chris Bayer could work on it, right? Like we had somebody in-house and he raised his hand and said, I'm gonna do this. Um, that was the big one of them. And the other one was resources. But that would, you know, whether or not there was any science behind the resources, I don't know. Like, you know, I'm, I, I suspect anything I was told in, 2017, late 2017. So. Yeah, I mean, I can't imagine that there would be much of a difference unless there's just like some in, inordinate overhead of memory allocation that Qt requires, or there's a bug in it that just, you know, it cycles in a loop too often or, or is too resource intensive in that sense, you know. Um, I mean, ultimately, when it comes down to it, they're doing all the same things, you know, they're doing blitz and you know, rendering text sometimes and all that stuff is really straightforward. So from the, from the perspective of, you know, so if the only other question is processor time, if we put that one to bed, are you still with us, Chris Gessling? So get with Aditya and say, Hey man, like the, the only thing standing between us and adopting your stuff that you've been working on for the last four years is processor time. Can you assure us that this is going to run on a Pi 4 and better yet, can you show us a demo? Then, we just say, Chris Bayer, we love you, brother, but you're going to have to learn QT, and we're going to have to port this stuff across, and the decision's made. Let's move on. I mean, I, I, it's, I, it's I don't see any reason. I don't think it's necessarily that easy because you know the other reason that Kibi is chosen as a as a system is that it's Python based rather than C based, right? And I don't I don't know enough of the details to make a good argument. Make a good way, argument. But, uh, I, I, I tend to I tend to take exception to that. At the end of the day, all of these are going to be C based uh, down low enough, uh, and then what they expose or extend <laughs> upwards may be more uh, Python friendly. That that could certainly be the case. I don't know enough about it, but um, I would say that if you had a working system of each in front of you and you ran top on them on a terminal, and then put it through its paces. 
just visually, you'd be able to get a really good idea of what's going on. I mean, and if that wasn't that different, then you could get down to a gnat's ass and actually write some code, but I don't think that would be necessary. Yeah, yeah I just that. think yeah, I just think side by that. side with top or there's another be there's a better version of top out there. I forget what it's called. You'll be able to see, you know, what it's consuming and, you know, have it going through the paces with our code and precise running and our overhead, since that's really what it's going to be doing and see if there's anything perceptible that's different. You know, I don't think that's that tough once we have a working Kivy and QT system side by side. OK, let's. Let we're rehashing this, this. We've been over this a bunch of times, and we've actually taken all these notes before. So, uh, you know, uh, I guess I, I'll leave it to you to decide, you know, when's the right time to tackle this um, in terms of, you know, insofar as it's affecting the community, right? Uh, it's, it's not a, you know, it's not a critical issue for us just yet. So let's try to focus our efforts on the, on the things that are, are going to be problems. Uh, okay. Any other any other things people want to talk about today? Okay. Great. Uh, well, it seems like everything's sort of proceeding apace. So um, I am saddened to hear about your hardware problems, Ken. Uh, but um, it could be self-inflicted. I don't know. I, but I really haven't been doing like a lot of messing with the hardware, you know, other than plugging the edge connector in and out and. I mean, remember, the reskeeper is simply lying out in an external power unit, so sure. it can't have anything to do with that. So uh, the only potential difference, which I've run by Kevin, and he doesn't seem as a big deal, is that he soldered over the uh, USB uh, power jumper, and, and he was under the impression that should be fine just the way it is. So I'm at a loss, yeah. Uh, uh, but well, It sounds like that's about to start holding up your work, right? Although you're right. checking in your enclosure code now, right? So you kind of stopped working on that for the time being. No, I'm going to go ahead and proceed uh, with a pull request for Chris V on Wednesday uh, with the stuff in, in there working, assuming in the absence of working hardware that it should be working, and then we'll take it from there. Uh, but yeah, the, the sooner I can get a good working piece of hardware, that'd be great. And I'd really, I'll, I'll create a ticket and I'll follow up with Kevin and ask if he's actually plugged the SJ201 in and pulled it out and, and did it do anything to the to the microphones okay okay yeah we'll, we'll, we'll need to get you a uh, a working a fully working mark to, you, know, a, you know prototype i think by friday uh, see if we can get just the sk201 i i have two pi fours here i have everything else i need i just need a sj201 i mean i i i don't mind having one of them using the old amp and one of them using the amp built in that's fine. That would be what I would have, right? Okay. Well, I'd like you. I'd like you to have one that's just a Mark II, and then the other one can be the, the bare SJ two hundred one board that you use USB or whatever. But I'd like to have one of each. Yeah. So that's what I was saying. So, so really, just a working SJ two hundred one would do it because even the one that's kind of defective with the speed with the mic, I could plug it into the re-speaker if I wanted to and get by. So just a good working SQ201 would be fine. And I'll, like I said, I'll follow up with Kevin and make sure this is not a potential issue. Cool. All right. You want to get to the point where all the SJ201 devices we all have are as identical as possible. Oh, no. When, when we get a finally a working version, we're going to chuck all of the old ones in the garbage. Uh, I, I, may, I may insist that you send them back to Kevin or something like that just so we don't have them sitting around. <laughs> My my first PC came a friend. They, they go. They go up the, there. Yeah, <laughs> they go up there on the on the shelf with. Yeah, send them here. My first PC came from a friend who worked at the warehouse that was supposed to destroy PCs for IBM on contract. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> Is there anybody you don't know, Ken? <laughs> No, well, yeah, I won't go there. <laughs> Tell Donald Trump I I, I was just going to say, I've never met the Cheetah in Chief. <laughs> All right. Uh, on that happy note, uh, I guess we'll call it a day. Uh, so thanks, everybody. We'll talk again Wednesday. Everybody on Wednesday. <laughs>